All right, this really is a small group tonight, but it is my pleasure to be here with you. And my goal tonight is quite simple. What I want to do is to try to demystify what psoriatic arthritis is. Because it really is, to me, I'm, I'm passionate about psoriatic arthritis, but it really is a complex disease. Now here are my disclosures, meaning that, that I do have uh, a financial engagement with research and experts' uh, opinion with various uh, pharmaceutical companies. Now my objective tonight, as I said, I want to review what psoriatic arthritis is and try to explain or try to uh, review how often it can occur. And I do want to review the disease as well. And if we do have time and interest, we'll look at a bit of the therapies that are available today. Now with lack of time, I'll skip over a few. Now a bit of history. It's really interesting that psor like psoriasis has been known for eons, for years and years and centuries, and arthritis as well. But the link between psoriasis and arthritis is really quite recent. There was a first association that was noted in 1818, but then it took over 100 years before any interest was rekindled in that entity. And it's finally 1964, not very long ago, that the disease was really recognized as having an association between the skin disease of psoriasis and arthritis. Now, psoriatic arthritis affects men and women equally, and the age of onset is between 20 and 50, but we, you, what we usually see are two peaks. So one peak around 20 to 35 years of age, and then there's a second peak around 45, 55 as well. Now, the true prevalence, in other words, how often it occurs in our society, really is unclear, and there's there's a few factors that could explain that as well. One of the problems is that the definition of psoriatic arthritis is varied. Now, the definition that was used in the 70s and 80s isn't the same that we used today. So a lot of the patients that were uh, diagnosed as having uh, rheumatic arthritis in the 1980s maybe do have psoriatic arthritis if we look at the classifications today. And the other problem is that it really has a varied clinical presentations. There's a lot of stuff going on in psoriatic arthritis. And the term arthritis is really misleading because there's way more than just joint involvement in psoriatic arthritis. This being said, about 7 to 40 percent of patients who do suffer from psoriasis will eventually develop psoriatic arthritis. What this means is that it's not because you have psoriasis that you will necessarily have arthritis associated with it. And if you do have arthritis, it doesn't mean that it's going to be psoriatic arthritis. Commonly, the psoriasis is going to precede the arthritis by approximately 10, 15, some cases 20 years, although there's about 10, maybe 20 percent of patients that come into our office with arthritis as being the main presentation, and in the long run, we do discover that they have psoriasis as well. So as I said, it's a varied uh, clinical disease and there's not only joint involvement, there's really a lot of stuff going on. And the first thing that I do want to stress is when a physician gives you a diagnosis of psoriasis and then gives you a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis, it's not two diseases. It really is one disease with different presentations associated to it. And when we speak of arthritis, Arthritis is an inflammatory process. It's inflammation. The fire is going on in your body, and it's caused by a dysregulation of the autoimmune system, of your immune system. And as I was explaining last night, and I got a few chuckles out of it, the way I view our autoimmune system, I see it as an army. And in our army, we have our, our white cells, and that's our immune system. And in the army, there are different groups of soldiers that have different roles to play. 
And in the case of psoriasis, in the case of arthritis, it is one group of soldiers that are becoming, I would say, rebellious. They're hyperactive. And being hyperactive, they start secreting many molecules that cause the inflammation. And those molecules, that inflammation is going to affect the skin, it's going to affect the joints, and it's going to affect various areas of the body. So it really is one disease, and the beauty, if there is a beauty when we give a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis, is that oftentimes when we do treat one component, the arthritis, we do treat the psoriasis as well. So there is, there is a positive with such a diagnosis. All right, so psoriatic arthritis, and we'll go through what we see on the left column. It really has different components. So you can have joint involvement, skin involvement. You can have what we call enthesitis, tenosynovitis, dactylitis, and I'll explain all of that. You can have what we call spondylitis, and spondylitis is inflammation of the spine. And you can also have eye involvement, gut involvement, and as I said, we'll see pictures of that. We'll review that. But psoriatic arthritis is much, much more than that. And only to list a few here, it can cause osteoporosis, which is, is um, somewhat of a weakening of the density of the bone. It can cause what we call insulin resistant, a bit like diabetes. And what is quite new, I'd say maybe over the last 15 to 20 years, is that we're seeing a link with psoriatic arthritis, with psoriasis, and depression. And initially, we thought that the depression was due to self-image, people that have a lot of psoriasis or have a lot of joint pain, don't want to go out in public. Um, they have self-esteem issues as well. But we've noticed that, yes, it is a component of the depression, but it's more than that. We're thinking that the inflammation caused by psoriasis, by psoriatic arthritis, does cause somewhat some inflammation brain-wise and could, could be responsible for much of the depression as well. Like I said, there is much, much study going on with this. It's ongoing. Um, and we are uh, noticing as well with psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis that there can be heart problems as well, hypertension, increased cholesterol as well. Um, I don't mean to scare anyone. It's uh, it's it's. There's a lot of research going on, so we do know that it's a complex and varied disease, and it, uh, it warrants a lot of attention. Up to recently, I'd say maybe over the last 20 years, it used to be considered as being a very benign disease, and we do know now that it is a serious form of arthritis, and ideally what we want to do is to try to diagnose it early and implement treatment early as well. So, one of the problems, like I said, is that if you have psoriasis, you have a 7 to 40 percent chance of developing arthritis as well. But then there's 60 percent of people who will never develop arthritis associated with the psoriasis. And the tough question is, who presenting with psoriasis will develop arthritis? And the problem is, we don't know. We can't identify properly those patients. And what we want to do, what we really wish to do, is to early on identify the patients that have psoriasis that are at risk of developing the arthritis. Now the problem with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis is that we now know that it has a genetic component. In other words, when you're born, you have genes that predispose to having uh, psoriasis or arthritis. Now, what causes those genes to wake up and start secreting molecules that will cause disease later down the road? We have no idea. That is what we don't know. And that probably explains why you have either psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis, and your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle doesn't have it. And that's the component. That is what we do not understand today. <coughs> what we do know is that there are certain forms of, of psoriasis, of skin disease, and there are certain distributions of that skin involvement that does predispose to developing arthritis someday. Now, although it's not an absolute, patients that have severe skin involvement do have a tendency to have uh, more arthritis associated to it. And as well, patients that have 
scalp involvement uh, around the, uh, the, the genital area, the bum, uh, the gluteal fold. Patients that do have psoriasis in those areas do tend to have a higher prevalence of arthritis and nail involvement as well. We'll see a few pictures, but patients that do have a bit of the pitting or, or, or discoloration or psoriasis of the nails do tend to have arthritis or involvement of those digits, either the fingers or the toes. Now we can have skin involvement, we can have joint involvement, and now we get into what I call the itty gritty, the more complex association with psoriatic arthritis. Now we can have enthesitis and tenosynovitis. And itis is inflammation, so we have inflammation of the enthesis, and enthesis, as we see in the middle picture, is where the tendon inserts into the bone. So what that means is that we have many tendons in our body, and therefore they all insert into bones, and we, we have a possibility of inflammation everywhere those tendons insert into the bone. Uh, there can be some inflammation. And one of the typical areas, and that's the picture we see on the far left, that's the Achilles tendon, so the heel tendon. And we can see on the right foot that it is very small and it's thickened. And we often, and quite often, see that in patients that have psoriatic arthritis. So once again, enthesitis is inflammation of where the tendons insert into the bone. And then we can also have tenosynovitis, so itis, inflammation of the tenosynovial, and the, that, that component is what we see in blue in the hand on the right picture here. And what that, that is is a, a sheath that covers the tendons, certain tendons that we have in our body, mainly that we find in our hands. Now, a lot of patients do present with what we call trigger finger, so it's a blockage or inflammation of that, uh, that uh, sheath that covers the tendon, or they notice that when they flex, they move their fingers, the hair crunching, almost like Rice Krispies, or it's very thick and it's quite painful. So that can also be associated with psoriatic arthritis. Now these are different sites, it doesn't come out very well, but these are different sites that the rheumatologist uh, usually examines to see if there is inflammation. Of these, uh, of these tendon insertions. Now the problem with enthesitis is that it's not because there is inflammation or pain when we do examine some of those areas that it's necessarily associated with psoriatic arthritis. And that's where the diagnosis is often difficult to make. As we can see, we can examine the shoulders, we can examine the elbows as well. Uh, the side of the hips as well. And those are common sites where people do have pain, especially people that are very active. We have golfer's elbow, tennis elbow. Um, sides of the hips are very frequent as well in, in, uh, in women. And those are not necessarily sites that are associated with the arthritis. Now the sites that we do like and that are, are usually involved in psoriatic arthritis are around the kneecap the tendon of the heel as well, and uh, all around the hip bones. When those areas are tender, those can be very uh, significant sites for a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis. So this being said, when your doctor does examine you, oftentimes patients look at me and they say, doctor, I, I don't have any pain there. I'm coming in because I have toes and, and hand problems, and you're looking at my shoulders and my back and whatnot. And there is a link. We are looking for more clues to try to uh, have a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis. Another presentation of psoriatic arthritis is what we call dactylitis. And dactylitis is really almost like a sausage appearance of either a finger or a toe. And it can happen over one, two, three, four, five uh, toes or fingers. And they're, they really look like a little cocktail sausage. They're very red, swollen, extremely painful, and the inflammation does subside with time. So what we see on the left 
uh, picture, we have two toes that are very swollen, that is the dactylitis. We have fingers at the bottom that are very sausage-like as well. And what we see on the right side are uh, ultrasound pictures that I took of patients that do have dactylitis. And the nice thing about these pictures is that it really looks as if there's fire going on. And, and patients associate to that. They come in and they say, I feel like I'm burning. I feel like there's fire going on. And really, when we look at the, the images where there is inflammation, it really looks like fire. I won't go into much detail here because we do have uh, somebody from the dermatology team that's going to talk about psoriasis, and I'm really not an expert. But there are different psoriasis presentations, and certain forms of skin involvement do predispose as well to having arthritis. The last component, so we can have eye inflammation and intestinal inflammation as well. Thank goodness that does not occur often. It is really quite rare. When there is eye inflammation, it's a process that is extremely, extremely painful. Patients can't look at the light. Uh, they usually go in quite quickly to the emergency room. It requires prednisone drops. Usually we have to put them uh, several drops every hour, and then we, we put them every three to four hours. So it's really an eye pain that is typical. We can also have um, <clears throat> inflammatory disease of the intestines, so Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis as well, and it's really ulcers. It's inflammation that can be found throughout the intestine or throughout the gut. It can go from mouth down uh, to the anus, and it's really a painful uh, disease. Finally, the last uh, process or the last component associated to psoriatic arthritis is nail involvement. And again, the uh, dermatologist will review those with you. And there are different forms or different presentations of nail involvement that can also predispose or increase uh, the link to psoriatic arthritis. So what we see here is the prevalence, so how often the different manifestations that we just discussed does occur in psoriatic arthritis. So what we see is that most patients do have arthritis. Uh, about 100% will have psoriasis associated to the disease. 83% will have nail involvement. About 50% will have the little sausage digits, so the dactylitis. And the studies uh, that I did use report about 33% of enthesitis associated to psoriatic arthritis. Quite honestly, I'd say it's more about 15, maybe 60% of patients that do have it. And as I said, eye inflammation and gut inflammation luckily is quite rare. So how do we diagnose psoriatic arthritis? Um, there's different, this is an old classification that we use to use to diagnose psoriatic arthritis. And there's really different presentations, as we can see, of the disease. Now, that's not a classification that we use much today. What we usually, how we usually classify psoriatic arthritis today is either having uh, a spine involvement, so what we call spondylitis with psoriasis, or then we think of psoriatic arthritis as having involvement of the arms and of the limbs and not having uh, involvement of the, of the spine. The picture down at the bottom, what we call arthritis mutilans, luckily is an extremely rare presentation of the disease, which we should not see much of today. And it's really a catastrophic presentation because what happens is that there's so much destruction of the joints that the fingers or the toes um, shrivel up, almost like a telescope, and when you gently pull on one of those fingers or one of those toes, they take a normal appearance, but as soon as you let them go, they shrivel up, and it goes back to that presentation. So it's rare, but one case to me is one case too many, is one patient too many, and thankfully with our treatments today, we don't see that very much. So very quickly, how do we diagnose psoriatic arthritis? Now, you can go into the office and see your rheumatologist and have many complaints, many aches and pains, 
And unfortunately, sometimes the physician will tell you, well, you don't have the criteria, you don't have psoriatic arthritis. And so what we use is that you need to have what we call inflammation, an inflammatory process of either joints, the spine, or enthesitis. And then you need to score at least three points in the following categories. Now, if you have psoriasis, you have two points. If you've already had psoriasis, one point. Or if there's a family history of psoriasis, one point as well. If there's nail involvement, you get one point. Uh, dactylitis, the sausage digits, you get a point. If there's damage on x-rays, you get a point. And then if you have what we call a negative rheumatoid factor, you also get an extra point. Now, the negative rheumatoid factor, and oftentimes that's what you hear, you go see your, your GP, your family physician, and he's gonna t he or she is gonna tell you, well, I don't have any sign of arthritis, all your blood work is normal. And what they usually refer to is they're gonna dose two factors in your blood, they're gonna look for two factors, the rheumatoid factor, and often what we call an anti-CCP, and those two markers are very specific to what we call rheumatoid arthritis, which is a completely different type of arthritis. And the other thing they can look at is for inflammation, uh, the sedimentation rate, the CRP, the C-reactive protein. And although a good percentage of patients with psoriatic arthritis or psoriasis will have inflammation in their blood, I'd say the majority, or quite often, they don't have any inflammation. So the poor physician is, a little bit, is flabbergasted. He's gonna say, well, you don't have any sign of arthritis and there's no inflammation, so it just can't be arthritis. But yes, it can be arthritis. So that's what makes it so complex. And that's probably one of the reasons why it's undiagnosed uh, today. So I'll move uh, quickly through. As I said, psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis has a genetic component to it. And a lot of our patients, first thing when I talk about starting medication, the first thing they're gonna ask me is, how long do I have to take it for? When can I stop it? Or when am I gonna be cured? Now, unfortunately, uh, most patients will never be cured. It's an ongoing disease. It's a disease they will have for the rest of their life. It's a bit like diabetes or hypertension. But as long as they do take the medication, most of the time they will have a stable disease. Now, a certain number of patients will have what we call remission, meaning that they practically don't have any disease or any apparent disease. And in those patients, what we like to do is to try to slowly decrease the medication. Now, occasionally we do manage to stop it completely. We're never uh, comfortable in stopping the medication completely because we do know that it's gonna recure. It's gonna come back down the road. And so about 20% of patients, we do manage to get them in what we call remission, so no evident active disease. And unfortunately, disease does come back in most patients at about three years time. And at that time, we do have to restart the medication. So that's one of the reasons why your physician is always a little weary uh, about stopping the medication completely. We're all very happy in decreasing the dose, but we're always a little worried about stopping it completely. So if we quickly look at treatment, and then we'll go into specific questions, uh, there's three different categories that we do use as treatment in psoriatic arthritis. Now, in red are what I call my fire extinguishers. So when the patient comes in, they're suffering, they're in pain, I want something that's going to try to decrease that inflammation and get the patient better fast. And those are uh, anti-inflammatories, so naproxen, Voltaren, uh, Celebrex, even Advil is an anti-inflammatory. And those do work, they do work for the pain, they do work for the inflammation. One of the problems with anti-inflammatories are the side effects. So stomach pain, uh, they can cause diarrhea. They usually are hard to take in the long run. They can cause high blood pressure, kidney problems as well. So we're always a little weary of keeping them long term. Now the second category is cortisone, prednisone. 
And we can either take that orally by mouth, we can take it by injections as well. Your physician can propose to have that injected at the enthesial, at the enthesitis site. Uh, we can inject it into the joints. It works extremely well. It's oftentimes, I wouldn't say miraculous, but works very well. But unfortunately, once again, ideally we never leave patients on cortisone for long periods of time. So there's other fire extinguishers. And when we stop them, uh, unfortunately, the disease flares up again. So that's where the second category, the DMARDs, uh, the disease, the, the, the remission agents that we have, that's where they come in handy. And those are the first medications that your physician is going to discuss with you. And never be surprised, ideally, we always try to combine the medication. Oftentimes, we'll, we'll start three therapies at once because they have different actions. And uh, we know that by combining them, they usually work better than separately. So never be surprised. When those agents either, uh, we can't use them because of side effects, because they don't work appropriately, or there's still a lot of disease, we then have a third category. And that's what we call our biotherapies, or biologic agents. And you might be starting to see some of those uh, advertisements on TV. There's Humira, Adalimumab, there's Embrel, Etanercep as well, uh, Symphony, Golimumab, or Remicade, and Fliximab, and those are what we call anti-TNFs. And anti-TNFs, um, as I said, they're biologic agents, so they're fabricated by um, using, for, for most of them, by using human, human cells. And what they do is that they target a specific uh, molecule that's involved in the inflammation. Now, at the beginning of the talk, I was saying that, you know, our, our immune system, I do see them as being an army, and then there's different soldiers, and there's one group of soldier that's really being hyperactive. So the goal of the therapy, it's not chemotherapy, because they're doing their job. They're just doing their job a little too well. Now, what we want to do is to calm down those cells that are being hyperactive. And by being hyperactive, they're secreting molecules that are creating that inflammation. And one of the molecules that they're secreting is the TNF. And that's a very inflammatory molecule that circulates in the blood. And that's responsible, at least in part, for the psoriasis, the skin involvement, and the joint involvement. So when we talk about biological agents, those are anti-TNFs. So when we do give that medication, what we want to do is, is have the medication go out through the body and prevent that TNF uh, from causing all of its damage, from causing too much inflammation. So it's not chemotherapy. We don't want to destroy the system. We don't want to destroy the autoimmune system because it's working. There's just a component that's being hyperactive. But what we want to do is, yes, to suppress it, but to suppress it to a level that's more acceptable. So we're not destroying. It's not chemo. We're just suppressing it to a more normal level. Unfortunately, as of today, we only have four agents in Canada that are approved for psoriatic arthritis, and they're all anti-TNF. And unfortunately, certain diseases are not caused by that TNF. They're caused by other molecules that are causing the inflammation. And that's where research molecules can come in handy. And hopefully, we're expecting over the next few months to have other molecules to be approved as well. So patients that are not responding to those agents, to those four agents, we will have other options. So there is a lot of research. There is a lot of hope. And, um, and we do have a lot of therapies coming in. So I'll skip over that and go to questions. And what I want to do, I want to finish with this slide. I really do like it. Um, oftentimes, I, I, I beg my patients, don't go on the internet. Don't start Googling. What you'll find is often not very accurate, unfortunately. And it's really not because we have something to hide. It's just the information, the, the information that is out on the web isn't always accurate. Fortunately, we have societies like the arthritis people, uh, the arthritis society that are giving us accurate information as well. 
And those are actually pictures when I Google psoriatic arthritis, pictures that I pulled out from the web as being first pictures. And we see a lot of deformations. We see a man uh, in the middle that has back involvement as well, and he has a very stiff back, what we call uh, somewhat uh, ankylosing spondylitis. And what I want to stress is that the disease is not the same today, simply because thankfully we can diagnose it much earlier, it's recognized much earlier, and we're a lot more aggressive in our treatments as well. We start treatment way earlier and we have better treatments as well. So really this is what we should see today and we should not ideally see um, the catastrophic disease that we saw in the previous years. I could keep going and going, but uh, any questions at this point? What is your feeling on Stellara? So a Stellara works often wonders for skin. Unfortunately, it doesn't work very well in joints. Uh, we have a very partial response. Um, some patients do respond. It's not approved yet in Canada for psoriatic arthritis. Um, will it be approved? I imagine, but right now it is not. It, it, it does work. It's not, uh, it hasn't performed quite as well as what our anti-TNFs have performed. You mentioned the fire extinguishers, so yes. Celebrates, for example. Yes. So I take Celebrates over 100 milligrams. And the reason I do that is because I read a lot about the issues with uh, coronary um, and uh, stroke and um, uh, incidents with higher <laughs> higher doses of Celebrex, so like the 400 milligrams a day, which seems to be the most common dose for psoriatic arthritis. So I'm wondering, with me on 100, such a low dose, comparing that to the biologics, where I, I see so many side effects that kind of scare me as well, if I'm staying low at 100 milligrams, as long as that continues, is that probably the better place to be right now? Oh, that is a tough question. So that is always something you want to discuss with your physician. Um, we're not being naive. There is no medication that does not have any side effects. Now we have to look at the pros and cons and what is the most uh, beneficial for the patient. Now if the person comes in and tells me, you know what doc, I feel good. I'm not perfect, but I function. And if I assess the patient and I find that there's maybe a bit of disease, but it's minimal and I can follow it, Yes, I may, I may accept a bit of, of anti-inflammatories, but if the disease control is not perfect, we will have to discuss other options as well. And I didn't go into much detail. That was not the, the object of the presentation today, but yes, there are side effects associated with the use of biologic agents, uh, but they are, in my opinion, quite minimal compared to the benefits that we can get out of using those biologic agents. And the beauty of them is that most of them we do, they are approved since either 1999, 2000, either for other diseases or for rheumatoid arthritis. Most of them for psoriatic arthritis have been approved since 2004 and 5. And, and they're used worldwide. And we, we are up to about 3 uh, million patient years of, of usage for certain of, of those biologic agents. There are a lot of registries, meaning that in other countries, as soon as the patient uses that agent, they are uh, um, put into a data system. And we can do quite a bit of research, quite a bit of data analysis out of those registries. And it's, it's given us a lot of information. Now, the main side effects of those agents, there's always infection. Like I said, we're suppressing somewhat your immune system, but then again, we're suppressing it with the cortisone, we're suppressing it with the other agents, such as the, meth as the methotrexate as well. So it is a risk um, that, we need to, that you need to discuss with your physician. And then there's always the question, a lot of the patients come in and they said, you know what, I looked on the internet and it says that biologic agents cause cancer. Now if they did cause cancer and being a sure thing, they would not be available on the market. They would not be available in Canada at least. Now there have been certain associations to certain cancers, uh, the main one being uh, melanoma, so the uh, 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 malignant skin disease. 
but it, you really have to treat about 8,000 patients for having one case of melanoma. So there's really a lot more benefits of using those agents, and I as a physician, I have nothing to gain prescribing those agents other than seeing the before and after of the patient. And a lot of the patients, that is what saved, literally saved their life, their quality of life. So we need to realize that all agents do have side effects and we just need to calculate the pros and cons of each, of each agent. Other questions? You mentioned four agents, uh, anti-T and F. Could you name them? Absolutely. Um, so there are three agents that we give what we call subcutaneously, so the patient can actually give that injection themselves at home. So the first one at the top, the Humira, is given twice a week. It can even be given once a week if the control of the disease isn't perfect. Embrel is given once a week. Uh, the Symphony or Galimumab is given once a month. And it doesn't mean that the dosage is stronger, it's just the way it's fabricated. Uh, that lasts longer in the system. And the last one down at the bottom, or the second to last, is the Remicade. And that is given intravenously, um, and it can be uh, given according to the weight of the patient. We can increase the dosage. It's usually given in every eight weeks. It can be given in every seven, six, according to the response. So we really have three subcutaneous agents and one intravenous agent as well no oral agents for the time being. Yes, um, how long has uh, these uh, agents been on the market? And uh, how long was the research, uh, how long ago was the research started? So research before a molecule is officially put on the market, so being approved by uh, uh, either in Canada, the States, in Europe, they have to go through a very rigorous process, different phases, of trials of research. So most of them have been researched since the mid-late 80s, and they were approved either 99 or 2000 for most of them. So Humira and Remicade are the oldest ones. They've been approved roughly since 2000. They weren't approved for psoriatic arthritis initially, not because they were considered dangerous or because they weren't uh, it's just that the first disease that they did look at was uh, rheumatoid arthritis, but it's the same agent, it's the same dosage, so really since 2000, they have been approved. Tell me, does the government of Quebec cover these items? They do. Uh, you need to respond to certain criteria for the government to... Um, I was told uh, that you can you got to be in a position where you can't tie your shoelaces, you can't do much of anything, and that's when they give it to you, when you're ready to die. I wouldn't go quite that far. <laughs> I usually don't wait that long before I start the agents. No, absolutely. Um, there, there's a reason why, because they're extremely, extremely costly. Uh, most of them will go between, I'd say roughly fifteen, twenty thousand dollars um, But no, we do need to have a certain number of swollen joints, a certain extent of skin involvement. You need to be quite sick to have those agents. Not near death, though. <laughs> Hi, dear. Uh, I'm always on the lotted. That's the only thing that helps me uh, altogether. Uh, uh, two, uh, two milligrams of Dilaudid twice a day. Will I ever get off of it? It makes me sleep a lot. <laughs> well, all depends why it's given to you. If it really is arthritis, then inflammation, uh, yeah. then there are other therapies that are available. Unfortunately, I've been everything. you've tried. I, I don't know. It's horrible. <laughs> I, I don't know. And tell me something. Does aggravation cause the arthritis to flare up more? Uh, aggravation in what? Okay, like my daughter is in a coma. Right uh, yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> yes. Any stress, infection, okay, stress. Um, and oftentimes patients will tell us, you know, I keep saying we don't know what, what causes, what, what 
um, makes those genes to wake up and, and develop that arthritis. <laughs> but oftentimes patients are going to say, you know what, doctor, it happened that day. I lost my job. I was in the hospital. I had an accident. Somebody yeah. died. They have a stressor. Okay, Is now what does methotrexate do for the body? Sorry? Methotrexate? Yes. What does that do for the body? I see, find I'm losing a little bit of hair. Uh, so methotrexate is uh, one of the main agents that we use. One of the reasons is that it does treat the psoriasis, yeah. maybe not perfectly, but it, it is one of our favorite agents because it also uh, treats the arthritis. Um, so methotrexate can be used, and I do want to stress that, can be used as chemotherapy but oh, really? not at the doses that we use either in psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis. Mm -hmm. Now the most that we will use the methotrexate at is 25 milligrams a day, and that is not anywhere near a chemotherapy okay, dose. Okay, like I'm taking eight a day. So probably eight, eight tablets of 2.5. value, I mean. Yeah. So you can either have it by mouth orally or subcutaneously as well. It's once a week. Uh, main side effects are usually uh, nausea, diarrhea, if you're taking it by oh, mouth especially. And uh, it can cause some liver problems, so we do need to follow blood work on a regular basis. Well, my doctor is so. checking me every two months, the blood test for the methotrexate. Good Tre doctor. Methotrexate, <laughs> I pronounced it already. <laughs> That's right. Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Hi. I've been on Humira, I had been on Humira for about two and a half years and it was working great. And then I suddenly got my psoriatic arthritis was much, much, much worse. So they took me off of it immediately. Why would that suddenly happen? There, we're not completely sure. One of the probable reasons is that, like I said, it's, it's they're developed uh, through human cells, but they're not your cells. Mm -hmm. So there's always a possibility that your body will react Reject. or develop, a, develop antibodies against the medication. Now it's not dangerous, it's just that it loses its efficacy. So oftentimes what we're going to do in that case is that we're going to combine methotrexate to the biological agents to minimize or ideally prevent the development of those antibodies. And methotrexate gave me liver damage. See, that's, that's the right. problem. So sometimes we can't use it, right. um, and, then, and then we're we screwed. Can, <laughs> right. I wouldn't allow myself to use that term, but we are in a bit of a pickle. So what we often do in that case is that we switch to another agent, and it's not because we failed one agent, one anti-TNF, that we're necessarily going to fail all the other ones as well. So that's what the, the biologic agent is an agent that is fabricated through a human cell uh, or through uh, um, a live cell. So they're cultivated and, they're, uh, and we're, we develop the medication through the use of those cells. So it's very different from methotrexate or sulfasalazine or the other medications in that for most of our agents, they're fully or mostly humanized compared to the other agents. So that's where the biologic component of it comes from. It's very simplified, but... Uh... Any more questions? No, I think we have one more. Yeah. Uh, tell me, uh, a general GP, is he really competent to um, assess a psoriasis? Uh, in, 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 at any age, would all the complexity of the treatments and the uncertainty uh, of uh, developing arthritis or not, even arthritis can develop without being linked to the psoriasis, by be whatever reason, it seems very, um, you, you need to be a specialist, right? Well, I have the utmost respect for all the GPs, all the family physicians. They have so much to know and so much to deal with. I, uh, I'm a specialist, and, and you know what? I deal with one thing. I deal with arthritis and the inflammatory or the autoimmune system. So asking a, a GP to know everything from depression to 
uh, gynecology is, is a lot to ask for, and it all depends on the type of practice they have. What we do hope for uh, from the GP is that they recognize either the skin involvement or the joint or some of the pain that could suggest a form of arthritis and have the patient referred to, to a specialist. So I, like I said, um, I, I wouldn't say it's a question of competence. Some are excellent because they, they uh, treat a lot of patients with it and they develop an expertise, somewhat of an expertise. Um, but ideally, they, they, they should be at least assessed once by a rheumatologist to eliminate a diagnosis or confirm a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. So what I would like to do to start off with is to talk to you a little bit about my pers perspective of a dermatologist in relationship to the psoriatic skin. How many of you here have psoriasis of the skin? So pretty well, you know, we've got eight or ten, okay. So let me just tell you how my perspective had changed with, with evaluation of uh, psoriatic skin was that in about 1997, I started doing research with the doctor was mentioning about biologics. We started with the, one of the first ones, which was called Raptiva, which has since been pulled from the market. And one of the things that, that I really learned from, from doing the biologics is that when patients come to see dermatologists, for example, they're often very embarrassed about their psoriasis, okay? And, and, and we say, how, you know, I've had patients come in for the studies, and I say, well, how are you doing? They say, oh, I'm doing really pretty good, doc, you know? And I, I say, well, let's, you know, let's, let's have a look, you know? But when you're doing studies, you have to have the patient take all their clothes off, okay? You have to see them from top to bottom. And, uh, and, and all of a sudden, for what that patient said, oh, I'm not doing so bad. I look at their skin, and it's horrible. I mean, it's really out of control. But for them, for that patient, perhaps they had a little bit less scale or something, and for them it was an improvement. It's all relative, okay? So what the point that I want to make with that thing is that when you go to the dermatologist, okay, and you say, uh, they say, how's your psoriasis? And you say, okay, and they say, well, can you show me something? And you just unbutton your sleeve and show them a little bit, okay? They may think that that's all that you have, okay? And that's where they may just give you a cream and tell you, you know, it's, it's just a little bit of psoriasis. Forget about it. You've, first off, you need to show your dermatologist, how much you've got, okay? So, you know, ask for a gown or whatever, and, and, uh, and uh, so get, give them an idea of the extent of the psoriasis. Because if you have a certain degree of psoriasis of the skin, we don't just treat it with, with, with creams, okay? We treat it with some of these agents you saw here or light therapy. The second thing that probably changed my feeling or understanding of psoriasis the most was, was I was at a lecture in Barcelona and there was a, 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 a woman who was a dermatologist who got up and she spoke about what it was like to have psoriasis for her and she was speaking from a physician to a physician and it really shocked a lot of my colleagues that were in the room because this patient got up and she said Do you know what it's like she says I, you know, I'm a physician, I have to get up in the morning, and I have to put a half an hour on the start of my day because I have to put you know, this cream there, that cream there, uh, I have to do this, I have to pick out the clothes so that I know that I'm not gonna have, you know, if I'm wearing dark clothes, I'm not gonna have scale that's gonna be showing on my clothes. And I mean, it was a really an eye-opener for me and many of my colleagues that were in the room to really understand the complexity and the difficulty of, of having psoriasis of the skin because initially psoriasis, you know, for many dermatologists, just, it's a cosmetic thing. Well, it, it's not a cosmetic thing. As we know that, uh, that they have, you've, I'm sure you've all filled out those DLQIs, those, the, the quality or the quality of life forms uh, that when you uh, sometimes see your doctors. Well, you would, might be surprised to know that, that, that when you do the, the measure the quality of life of patients with psoriasis, they're rated the top three worst, okay? The, I think it's the worst for uh, emotional and the second for physical disease, okay? So patients feel better off having cancer than they do having psoriasis, 
Okay, it might surprise you. Uh, and, but you think about it, you know, that all these things, the, the skin cracking, and then, the, the, you know, one of the things that, that, that I often tell doctors when I give lectures, like to, to physicians or GPs in particular, is I tell them, I said, listen, you know, I go to a restaurant, and uh, so there's where I, my office is in Westmount Square, so there's a, a Japanese restaurant down the, down the road which we like to go to, and invariably, Every time I'm trying to eat those, those sopa noodles or whatever, I get up from the meal and I got a few spots on my, on my, on my chest, on my shirt. And, and it drives me crazy. I mean, I can't go, to, if I'm going to go back to my office, I'm going to be scrubbing my shirt and the hair dryer because just the fact of having those two little spots on my shirt really drive me crazy. I don't want to have that. So I say, imagine if you will, if you've got psoriasis of your skin where you've got these big blotches all over, how, how difficult it is for patients to, 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 you know, to function in society. Because uh, when you think about it, uh, you know, I belong to a health club. It's rare that I ever see patients with psoriasis in health clubs because they're either embarrassed to go there, uh, feel shunned because people think, what, what the heck's that uh, on, on their skin? Am I going to catch something? Uh, so there, there's, there's a lot of, uh, I, you know, I, I feel very sorry for, you know, and I understand the, the, the difficulties of having psoriasis of the skin. So what I'd like to do today is to kind of talk to you a little bit about, uh, you know, what how to kind of manage the psoriasis, talk a little bit about some of the side effects of some of the drugs that you're most likely using and what's on the horizon, okay? And if you have any questions at all while I'm going, just put your hand up, okay? This is, we're, we'll keep it really informal. This is not like a formal lecture. So when I started doing, uh, I started doing my residency in dermatology many, many moons ago in 1976, and at that time we used to treat psoriasis with light and tar. Okay, so patients would come in, we would, we got this mucky uh, black tar and you would put it, the patients would sleep with this stuff on and then the next day they would go down to the, uh, uh, to the, the what's called the physiotherapy department where they had these lights and they would burn the heck out of their skin with these lights and the psoriasis would often clear up and would stay away for a period of time and that worked because ultraviolet light is an immunosuppressant. It's like the drugs that the, the doctor was just showing from, uh, I'll turn my phone off here because it's making all the bells. Uh, it's it's like, the, like the drugs, like the biologics. When the sun hits your skin, it suppresses the immune system and that's why the psoriasis gets better, okay? So that went on for a, for a number of years. And then what came along was people started to think that psoriasis is due to a problem. Nobody knew what, what was the problem with psoriasis. And somebody started thinking, well, maybe it had to do with the calcium. And so they started the, the drug called Dovinex, which is still around, uh, was one of the drugs that was used uh, to treat psoriasis. Now, along with that, we've always, had, we've always had cortisone cream. And I'm sure every one of you in this room has used cortisone cream at some point along to, to treat your psoriasis. So, what happens with, with cortisone cream is that when we have you come in initially and we start you on the, the cortisone cream, it may work really well and you may be very pleased, but unfortunately the body uh, or the skin adapts sometimes to those creams and it, doesn't be, it loses its, its uh, ability to, to treat the psoriasis. Um, and so what we sometimes have to do is we have to change from a different family of one steroid to another, and then sometimes that works, and we kind of go back and forth with that. So one point I want to make to you, that if you're using cortisone creams, is that there are side effects. Like, like the, uh, Dr. Adams mentioned, with whatever you use, there can always be side effects. And the side effects with cortisone are several things. One is it thins the skin, Okay, so it makes the skin, it can actually melt fat away and it can make the thickness of the skin thinner so that you may find that little bang that never bothered you before, you may get a bruise. And it, so it can make the skin thinner, it can make dilate some blood vessels on the surface and, um, and in certain areas, for example, like in the groin, it may make you predisposed to getting a fungus there. So, how do you, so what do you do to, to, to manage that? Well, first off, cortisones come in different strengths and, and potencies. 
One of the biggest mi or, uh, mis misconceptions that patients have is that when they look at the number that the doctor wrote, it, like when you get it back from the pharmacy, it says like Dermavade 0.05 or, or whatever, they have a number on it. Those numbers are of no importance whatsoever. Okay, they are uh, the concentration of that particular drug. All cortisones are, are the strength is, is basically based on the, on, the, on the type of molecule they have. So you can have 1% hydrocortisone and you can have 0.025% of dermavate cream, okay? And the dermavate cream is 25 or 50 times stronger than the 1% hydrocortisone. So the strength, those numbers behind that have no importance at all. It's the group of drugs that they have. So they, they divide the cortisone creams into six or seven categories, mild, you know, very, for sort of for face and groin, and then different strengths right up to the, the really potent ones like clobetazole or dermavate and, and these kind of things. So you have to be careful, and it's, and it's one of the, the problems that we sometimes see is that even the doctors that, that prescribe it, so the family doctor may not even be aware of that. He gives you a prescription, and you go home putting Dermavate on your, on your face for uh, six months, well, you're gonna have a lot of very thin, thin fragile looking and aged skin. So um, there's different potencies for different areas, okay? Um, do you have any questions on cortisone cream at all, or? No, it's pretty clear. Okay, and there's there just one like one last thing is that they come in in you know creams and lotions and ointments. So the ointments tend to be a little stronger than the creams. Okay, uh, just because they kind of occlude, and uh, sometimes we often will use, for example, like you in certain areas, it's really difficult to treat with topical things like the palms and soles. If you wanna you wanna ask a dermatologist what's the the hardest thing for them to treat in psoriasis, it's palms and soles because the, the medication just doesn't penetrate through. Sorry, you had a question. When you talked about sunshine. Yeah. There's no cure for there's 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 no cure for psoriasis. Some people respond very well to light. There's others who don't. Just like uh, cortisone cream may work for some and other and others it won't. And but there are patients who get long periods of remission from ultraviolet light, unlike often like the cream. So that they'll go. Uh, I have patients, for example, who will fly down to Florida two three times a year. They'll lie out on the beach for a week and they're good for you know uh, five months or something like that, or there's, you know, patients go to the Dead Sea in Israel where it's below sea level and, and they, they can improve in those sort of things, okay? Yeah, yes. Well, listen, there's all kinds of other things that are, you know, you go to the Dead Sea, you've got, uh, it's below sea level, so you do get more radiation, but also, you know, you're in a, you're at the ocean. All these things are, I'm not so sure that it's so superior to going to Florida, okay? But, you know, there's, whenever you, you know, you probably could take patients and put them on vacation, okay, and not do anything and they're going to get better. You know, you take... Stress, yeah. So you take people, you know, uh, uh, we used to take in the hospital, sometimes we would, we, you know, when we used to have beds in dermatology and it was easier to get patients into the hospital, sometimes you have people with bad eczema. You bring them into the hospital because their eczema is caused by stress or their psoriasis or whatever. Didn't do a thing to them, but they got better because we just remove them from the environment. So when you go away on a vacation and lie around, you've got no headaches, nobody yelling at you all day, uh, often things, the, the skin can get better, okay? Um, so we got, the, we got the cortisone cream sort of story. And then we've always had associated with that medications that we can give by mouth that help, help uh, the psoriatic skin, okay? And it might surprise you for, for me to tell you that Every one of you in this room, I can make your psoriasis be gone in a week, okay? You will not have any psoriasis on your skin at all within one week. But as everything that is good in life, there can be things that are bad about, about the things. And those, those medications uh, can have a very serious side effect. So there's drugs called cyclosporin or Neoral or cortisone. I can clear up, I guarantee you, you will have no psoriasis in one week with a high dose of this stuff. 
but you can get side effects and that's why unfortunately we can't keep patients on these drugs all the time because of the side effects. So we use those drugs to try and temper the psoriasis of the skin and then you know we can do other things. We sometimes can combine it with ultraviolet light or whatever. Trying to you know, always keep the health of the patient in mind, okay, to try and make the, the, the skin better, but not, dam you know, not clearing that up and making a problem elsewhere. Because uh, the NRL, for example, can, in, for a long period of time, can have problems on your kidney. It's a major, it's one of the drugs we use for, uh, for heart transplants, so there's all kinds of other stuff that can go with that. Cortisone is not usually a drug that we ever use. We try to avoid in patients with psoriasis because there's always been this story that when you put people on prednisone and you stop it, they can flare up, they can get much worse. I think it's a little bit of a myth, uh, but it, you know, this is something that, that's in there. We train, train doctors, dermatologists, not to give patients prednisone uh, by mouth for that. Methotrexate is one of the drugs that can, can help. There are obviously side effects, and if you like to drink a lot of wine, you're, you're not going to be getting methotrexate because the combination doesn't work too well. Uh, so you have to, there's all kinds of things you have to stop drinking essentially, and uh, then there's other things that if you take aspirin with methotrexate, you displace it and you can get into major problems. So you have to be very careful with those drugs. And the other one is called Soratane, which is a, like a vitamin, uh, a vitamin A. It's very similar to the drug Accutane we give kids for acne. And that can help be helpful for certain forms of psoriasis. So those are, those are basically the systemic drugs that, that we, we, ha we always had for many, many years for treatment of psoriasis of the skin. Then, yes? Yes, uh, it can displace the, the baby aspirin can displace the methotrexate so and make it more potent than the dosage that you give. So you can find that patients all of a sudden they have no, uh, no platelets or the platelets are going way down or their white blood cell counts are dropping significantly because it's like giving, it's like giving chemo, okay? So it's like the, the, the drug is is bound to a protein and that, that when that aspirin gets in, it displaces the methotrexate so that you get really a higher dosage than, than you were really given. So, so I have some problems, let's just say pharmaceutical mm -hmm. or yeah. you, can, you can do it, you just have to be careful, you have to monitor and you have to look at the, do you have to look at, uh, the dosage and you can even do you know, blood levels of all these things. But you know, it, it can be given but you have to be you have to be monitored. It's not something you just take like candy and, and, uh, and forget about it. Yes? What about methotrexate and the arthro uh, the, arth the Any of the sort of the, um, these non-steroidals sometimes can, but it's really aspirin, you know, aspirin that, that really displaces the, the drug, okay? But again, you need to speak to your, you know, speak to your rheumatologist who's, there, who's giving you that stuff. Now the the uh, the so in about as I said in 1997 uh, the uh, we started working on the first drug for skin one of the biologics called Raptiva, uh, there was another one that came along as well called Amivive. Both of these are off the market. Raptiva because of the side effects and it was actually uh, I had the largest number of patients on Raptiva in North America and it was my at, at our center that we noted that there was a side effect uh, when people came off the drug, they really got bad. And it was as a result of our publication that we made that, that actually eventually that drug was removed from, from the market. Amivive, which came along later, uh, or roughly a, a year or two later, was another drug which was very hopeful in the sense that it was one of the few drugs that you could give patients for 12 weeks, the drug, and then stop, and then some patients would have a remission even one to two years longer. But in reality, that was, it looked good on paper, but in reality, it wasn't that way. Okay, when we started doing studies, we found that, and on all the, the other centers, that as soon as we stopped, that often three months later, that we had to put people back on another course. So that drug kind of lost favor and then fell off the, uh, it was re the, the, it's no longer around, basically. 
And then, then the other drugs that you just heard about, Humira, Enbrel, Remicade, uh, they were in the hands of rheumatologists before they got in our hands. And then we started doing studies with those, and, and they're very effective. Okay, the, the, the Humira, Remicade, Stellara are, are the kind of the, 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 the uh, uh, um, uh, ones that are a little bit quicker to, to, to work, if you will, okay? And Embrel is a little bit slower, uh, but as time goes on, it, it kind of catches up there. So those, those are the, the basically the four drugs that we have access to. So uh, you heard the doctor saying she's got, they've got four anti-TNFs for, uh, for, for arthritis. Well, we got three anti-TNFs that we use, and we got Stellara, which is a different, of a different classification that uh, we use for the skin. And they all have, you know, the, the anti-TNFs are nice because if you've got arthritis, uh, it affects the skin and the arthritis, but Stellara can work for joints. We did a, we did a research uh, uh, study on, on looking at the, at the joints and patients on Stellara, and uh, it's slower to work, but it does work. I have patients uh, that were essentially almost crippled that, you know, are jumping up and down the hall now, okay? But it doesn't work in everybody, just like any, any, any particular drug. So what's on the horizon is there is a whole bunch of new uh, drugs that are called anti-IL-17s, and one of them is, is actually made by the company Amgen. It's called brotolibumab. If, uh, if I had to tell you if I've ever seen a drug that is amazing, that is a drug that I've never seen work on psoriasis as quickly as that one. Okay, I have patients with some of the one of my patients. One of the patients I have in, had of in that study had the worst psoriasis I've ever seen in my life. He's walking around with perfectly normal-looking skin right now. So I, I, it's amazing drug. He had horrible arthritis. His arthritis is better. It's not completely gone, but it's better. And most of the patients tell us the same thing, that they, they, some of them that have been on Humira or these other drugs before, that their, their arthritis is improving, but not at the rate that it did when they were on Humira. Yes? How are you able to do these studies if they haven't been approved, if you haven't got them approved yet? Well, because when we do, we're, we're part of the, the teams that do research. So, for example, at my office, one half of my clinic is all clinical research. So, so I have all access to drugs that are going to be uh, uh, maybe five years down the road, they're going to be on the market. So we go through, uh, we, do, we do, you know, patients, you've seen ads, I'm sure, in and, and papers or even probably from the Arthritis Society. If you've, you've got arthritis or you've got psoriasis of the skin with so much, you can come into a... I have to move over this way a little bit. Uh, moving out of the thing. The, um, you if you have a certain uh, amount of psoriasis, you can go into what's called a clinical study. And a clinical study allows us to have drugs that are not available on the market yet. And we, uh, right now, for example, I'm, we've got probably, I, I would say maybe 10 ongoing studies right now on psoriasis with newer with agents or even comparing agents that are on the market with other agents seeing what's better etc so we have these new drugs they they will come to us and they'll say okay we want to study this drug uh, and uh, we need you to collect patients so we collect the patients and we give the drug and we follow them over a period of years and years okay Well, uh, what, what do you mean? Well, I mean, any, any, any drug, I mean, it's just like any, any drug that you give a patient, somebody may get sick, and if somebody gets, a, uh, they can't tolerate the drug, we pull them from the study and we find another solution. Uh, if somebody gets, uh, doesn't want to take the drug, we, f we find another solution, etc. But it's, it's, just, it's like, like any, any treatment you would receive from your doctor. If there's a problem with a medication, you deal with it and you, you move on. Um, so, getting back to that, brotolibumab for me, I've never, as I say, is the most amazing drug I've seen for psoriasis in that I have patients that they come in, one lady, for example, uh, she's, she was obviously on a placebo, 
horrible psoriasis for 12 weeks. And I told her, I said, okay, when, you, when I see you in two weeks from now, I bet you you won't have any psoriasis. And she, was, and, and she did. She, had no, she came in, she kissed me, uh, you know, that, uh, that her psoriasis was completely gone from having basically 70, I think she had like 75% of her body covered with psoriasis, to just having a stain on her skin where the psoriasis was in less than two weeks. So really uh, amazing, amazing drug and to, to, uh, to, you know, and clearing up psoriasis. So that, yes. Everything that when you when you do a clinical study, you'll see that you're you're tested from one end to the other. Uh, everything that you've taken from from whenever you can remember is in in the thing. So we have all they keep they collect all the data as much as they possibly can. Yes. Okay, and it, I mean these things are very detailed. Every time my we one patient comes for a visit, they're they're probably with the nurse for an hour and a half. Okay, it's not like your your visit to the dermatologist, which is often relatively short. Uh, this is uh, you know it's I, I come in, I, I measure the psoriasis, or scales we use, we measure the psoriasis. The nurses do questionnaires asking them how they're doing. Patients fill in things how they're doing, etc. So it's a very complicated uh, procedure that is, has to, is done in all clinical studies, yes. When you're doing these things, mm. you don't know what the you do, and you, you do it to, to from previous, wherever previous studies have been, okay? So we're usually, uh, I don't like to do, there, there are phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, okay? So phase one is where you basically give a patient a shot of the drug and you see what happens. And then phase two, they give, they're, t they're testing kind of safety of the drug. They give maybe a couple of doses or whatever to see how it happens. Then when they realize that drug works, there's not really that many bad side effects, that it's something that you feel the company would, and the doctor would feel comfortable giving a patient, then they move to the phase three, where, where they basically give the drug to a patient. There would be some people on placebo, okay, so that you, you know, and, and they may be on placebo for three months, and then they go on to the real drug, et cetera. So like that lady that I told you about, she was obviously on the placebo for three months, and then, you know, at week 12, she gets a real drug, and then you see the, the change. But do I know? No. So, but when a patient clears up at week 12, do I know? Yes, I know. <laughs> okay? So, you, you know, you, you, you kind of suspect. And then at some point in time, uh, you know, these studies used to be, uh, they used to be, um, you know, like sometimes like four months, six months. Now they're all five years. So if you get on, if you get on these studies, the great thing is you got on, the, on a good drug, you got it for five years. Even when it goes on the market, you know, when these things would cost 25,000 bucks a year, you're getting them free of charge for that period of time. So, you know, so once we hit like now the one year mark, or even before that, they go into uh, things where we know that they are receiving the real drug. Okay, so we know at a certain point in the study, in many of these long-term studies, at week 52 or week uh, 36, uh, they're going to be on this drug and they're going to be on it for the rest of the study. Okay. Um, now, there are also some new oral drugs that you didn't hear about in the, in the talk, which are called JAK inhibitors. Okay, and JAK inhibitors are a new group of drugs that work in a similar fashion that they block the inflammation. So they, 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 they stop the inflammation like the biologics. The, the big problem with psoriasis is inflammation. So you stop the inflammation, you clear up the psoriasis. Stop the inflammation, clear up the arthritis. So these are a new group of drugs that have been around for uh, a couple of, uh, I've been using them now I guess for probably three years or, or probably maybe even four years. Uh, one is made by a company called Celgene, another one by Pfizer, and they work, they're, they're pills that you're, you take them by mouth, okay? So uh, for some patients who don't want to get a shot uh, every two weeks, here's another alternative, you take them daily. And um, so, and we've been getting, you know, good results with that. I have patients who've got, their, their skin has done very well. It has not been looked at, this rise, this is not, or arthritis has not been really looked at with these agents yet. Okay, and I can't honestly tell you that I, I that uh, any patients have said, yeah, my arthritis is doing fantastic with the, with these drugs, but they do work very well for the skin. 
okay, so that you can make the skin better. And in fact, right now, uh, we're doing studies with those oral medications. Uh, we have uh, two ongoing ones, and they also have now, uh, we did a study uh, two years or three years ago with a topical JAK inhibitor, and we're doing a study with that right now. So uh, for patients who've got less than 10% of their skin involved with psoriasis, instead of using cortisone cream, we can use these new JAK inhibitor creams, okay? So, uh, so which have no side effects vis-a-vis uh, -vis cortisone. So, you know, cortisone thins the skin. This stuff has no negative effect, nor theoretically can you think of a side effect that you're going to get with this stuff. So it's going to be an exciting, that's, it sounds like, a, you know, it could be a very exciting molecule to use for uh, psoriasis of the skin. Um, so that's kind of where we are now. And uh, as I say, there are newer, new agents as well that we're also testing. We've got some new ones that we're using for people who got psoriasis, the palms and the soles. And uh, so all of the companies, though, are going the Amgen way, okay? They're, they're all trying to develop these IL-17 drugs because they work like blockbusters, okay? Uh, and so that, I think, is going to be one of the, one of the uh, exciting drugs for the future, yes? So if you have psoriasis and psoriasis arthritis, you could uh, use the JAKS in combination with the biologic? We don't usually use the two of them in, in, in combination, first off, because the JAK inhibitors are not available, okay? You can't, you can't get them unless you come and do clinical research. So they're not, they're not something anybody can prescribe. And because they're a clinical investigational drug, you can't combine them with other, there, there's, there's no protocol to combine them with the other stuff, okay? Uh, you know, in theory, like, let's say in five years from now, if you're on a biologic agent and your psoriasis, you still got some breakthrough of psoriasis on your skin, yes, you probably could be a, be a great idea to use a JAK inhibitor cream, for example, on, on, the, on the psoriatic plaque, okay? So, yes? Uh, did I understand right that all of these uh, therapies do not actually deal with the disease, but somehow they, they exercise so much control mm -hmm. about, about, about the patients who mm -hmm. require the psoriasis mm -hmm. or whatever, uh, but eventually uh, these things are stopped, mm -hmm. the creams are stopped or whatever the psoriasis is. Yeah, I mean, you, you said the magic word, control, okay? And it's like diabetes. You don't cure diabetes, you control diabetes. And this is probably the biggest problem that we have in, in medicine or in dermatology is that many conditions are chronic, okay? And I have patients who come to my office, they say, they're very proud to say I'm the 10th dermatologist that they've seen because they're coming for their acne or they're coming for their eczema or they're coming for their psoriasis. And they went and saw the doctor and they gave them some stuff but they got, and they got better. But when they stopped it, it came back. Well, it's because nobody bothered to tell them that it's going to come back, okay? So uh, all of these, con many of these conditions, it's just not like, it's not like pneumonia, you know, they, you know, get a pneumonia, take an antibiotic, you get better, and you know, you don't get another one maybe for another 50 years, you never get it. It's not like that with psoriasis. It's a chronic condition that is uh, kept under control with medications, and eventually, at some point in time, you know, maybe you lose a bit of the control for whatever reason, and then you have to play around or switch around. But uh, and, but many patients are coming looking for a cure. There isn't one, not that I know of. Okay, any other questions? So I think I've used up my uh, allotted uh, half. Huh? Went to well, uh, what time? I was supposed to finish at 8, right? It, oh, is it 8.30? Oh, okay, well, I can keep on going. <laughs> yeah, yes. No, no. Uh, the, the, the sex of the patient has no bearing on how, how, how their, their, their skin condition, uh, nor does the treatment. Uh, and, and the age has no factor at all. I can tell you I've had patients uh, come in uh, with the, the, you know, horrible looking psoriasis and, and I, would, you know, I would think, well, gee, they had that all their life and I'll ask them when did it start. It would be like seven months ago. 
Okay, so it can come out of the blue. It can hit you like, like, a, like the hurricane. Uh, but certain things can make it worse as well, like certain drugs can make psoriasis worse. Beta blockers that are given for blood pressure can make your psoriasis flare up. So if I have somebody who comes in who says, I've never had psoriasis, I'm you know, 60 years of age, the first thing I'm going to ask him, did your doctor put you on a beta blocker by any chance or, uh, for your blood pressure? And if they say yes, then I tell them, well, listen, this may be part of the thing, and we, maybe we can speak to your family doctor and find some other drug to control your blood pressure other than the beta blocker. Okay, yes? Uh, so by inflammation, so, so two, two kind of parts of the question. The first is, what about um, so hypothyroid, um, hypothyroidism uh, and controlling that? And the better that you control that to reduce the inflammation. And what about diet as well? Diet has, well, I'll answer your diet first that, uh, you know, over the years, there's been all kinds of things that have, have come. There was one thing, a fish diet, or this diet, and so forth. There's never been any diet that's been shown to be uh, essentially effective for, for psoriasis. However, I'll just tell you one little anecdotal story that, that kind of blew me away, is that I had a patient of mine who is uh, with a very bad psoriatic who I've known what his disease is like over many, many years. And uh, he came to see me one day, he walked in to show me his psoriasis, and I was kind of taken back, at, you know, I think, geez, did I put him on a biologic or whatever? I said, what have you been doing? And he said, well, I've been taking turmeric, you know, which is cum 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 or cumin or whatever, the kind of Indian curry stuff. So, and I said, yeah? He said, yeah, he said, my brother-in-law told me about it, that it's an antioxidant and, and my, my uh, psoriasis is like this, you know? And, uh, and I, like I was really impressed because I knew what a psoriasis is normally like, you know, and he was doing pretty well. And he said, yeah, you know, I cut it down and my, my psoriasis comes back. So, and I was thinking, well, you know, like this kind of, I'm not a big naturopathic kind of guy. And um, so anyways, about a month later, all of a sudden in the, what our, our, we have a very, the prestigious journal for dermatology is called the Blue Journal of the American Academy. There, out comes an article about turmeric for the treatment of psoriasis. But it came back that it didn't work. And, but that could be because there's no dosage of turmeric. You know, they, they took little capsules and put the, put the stuff in. And this guy was telling me he was eating the stuff to, like, like he was, you know, he didn't want to look, ever look at it again. He was getting sick of the, the, the taste of turmeric. But uh, so anyways, somebody had thought of that. There, there was some reasoning behind that. So, there may be, so I tell patients when they ask me, is there anything I can do in my diet? I tell them, listen, you can, I, and I tell them that story, and I tell them, you can try it. If it works, phone me up or come and show me your psoriasis. I'll be interested. But, you know, I can't prove it to you. You know, I can't uh, show you a clinical study that, uh, you know, the turmeric makes it better. But I was pretty impressed with what he had, okay? And, and uh, you know, it's, you could see where the psoriasis stains were and where it's kind of looking ready to come out. Uh, but it would kept it under control. But other, other than that, no, there's nothing in, in diet as far as we know, okay? But when you think about how, you know, there's, a, there's an inflammatory thing and if turmeric really is an antioxidant and has some kind of effect, maybe that's how it works. Yes. Yeah. Um, can psoriasis change in form? Originally I had plaques and now mm -hmm. I'm trying to have like leopard type of skin. Yeah, sure it can. There's all different forms that, you know, people have gut ate little drops or people have pustular. There's people who sometimes, you, you know, I mean on the body, for example, you can have a, a plaque on the leg and you can have different stuff elsewhere. So it, it varies, you know, and it, you know, uh, as time goes along, things change all the time. It's, it's, a, it's kind of a disease that's moving all the time. Anything else? Any other questions? Out of yes. curiosity, what would be the role of genetics in disease? Well, genetics is a big factor. You know, it's, uh, you know, there's usually a family, you can usually find a family history, I mean, of Somebody who's got psoriasis in the family it could be an uncle way back or whatever. Uh, I mean, there's some patients who don't know, but it, as I say, it could be a cousin for, for, for generations back or something. But we believe that there is a genetic, there, I mean, there is definitely a big genetic factor. And so there are certain areas, for example, like in Newfoundland, uh, the incidence of psoriasis is like 6 or 7%. Uh, because it's kind of almost like, a, you know, everybody's, you know, people don't leave Newfoundland and not too many people move there. And uh, the same thing goes for, you know, Labrador. There's a very high incidence of, of psoriasis there. So 
which you know points to more of a genetic kind of because if you're if you keep everybody in the same area and you know relationships, it's going to increase the the instance just you know by by statistics. Yes. Is there psoriasis there? Uh, are there less likely to have psoriasis? Well, it's not that they're less likely, they're just being treated because they're in the, if they're in the sun. Uh, but, you know. And the sun is the key. Yeah, as I said, the, the ultraviolet light uh, can treat psoriasis. So, they, they, you know, that may diminish uh, some of the psoriasis that they see um, because psoriasis, you know, this, when you take sun, it, it's not just local immunosuppression, like if you put your arms out, it's not just, you know, it, uh, there, you can actually measure a systemic suppression of your immune system by, with sun exposure, so it has, an, has a general effect as well. But, um, you know, so psoriasis is, is, is there, okay? Yeah. Yes? Yes. Call what? Spasm. Spasm of what? Like in the fingers. It, sorry, if you have psori uh, sorry. Arthritis. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, I, I think that, again, I, I'm a dermatologist. I okay. should say, save that question for Dr. Adams. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you, yes, you can have spasm, but. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll stick to skin. <laughs> All right. Any other? Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Did yeah. You first of your cancer process. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you try and find some new molecules or different things, or did you try? No, no I mean, listen. To, 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 ask you to, do a study? to develop a, a molecule usually costs about a billion dollars. So if yeah. that, does that, did that answer your question? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, we work as, a, you know, we, as I say, at my center, we have, uh, have nurses, I have re my research assistants and whatever, but we do clinical research. Most doctors, you know, uh, in no matter, even if they're doing just purely research in a hospital or whatever, are not there to develop new drugs because it's super expensive. And uh, there's like one in a, a million of the, all going all the testing that, that actually works out to do anything. So it's the pharmaceutical companies that, that make drugs, not, not, a, not a physician. We, we, we test them out. Yes? Listen, I'll, I'll just tell you, I, I do uh, uh, skin cancer surgery. That's the other thing I do is I do what's called Mohs surgery. So I, I, I treat all the skin cancers. And I was just thinking about this again today because one of the, the funny things is that, that I, you know, I see, I don't know how many thousands of people with, basal, with skin cancers per year, but it's so rare I can count them on my hand, the patients who've had psoriasis. So there may be something protective about patients who've got psoriasis, and I, I can't give you a study on it, that, that maybe there's a little bit less incidence of skin cancer. Uh, you know, when I think, you know, we, 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 you know, we take patients, we used to grill the heck out of their skin with, with, with light, the, and, and patients who've got psoriasis, no sunlight makes them better, and they go out in the sun, but yet, you know, these patients who come to my office for skin cancer, it, you know, I just don't see psoriasis. So there may be some Something the some maybe that's one of the benefits that you're the, but I mean I have had a couple of patients who are really fair skinned uh, who have developed uh, you know basal cells or a form of skin cancer but overall it's it's to me uh, my impression is that it's less common but you know you just have to you know we have to balance like in anything you when you you give a drug you have to balance the risks with the, with the rewards. Okay, and so one of the rewards of, of light is it makes the psoriasis better, and but you know patients who are are followed for psoriasis are followed more perhaps a little more closely by a dermatologist or whatever, and uh, so if there's something that happens, you know something changes or some whatever they're usually going to be seen, okay, or or you you you'll, you'll think to ask the doctor what you know what's this or or whatever, okay. All right, any more questions? So, shall we call it a wrap? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you.